See, I like that the way that ended. <laughs> we must no longer be ashamed of being black. Amen. I came in uh, and I was riding and coming in here to the studio and I was listening to Al Sharpton. Now, I don't care a whole lot for Al Sharpton, but he said something that kind of struck to me, uh, stuck to me, where he said, uh, each generation must face their own battles. Well, this is a new generation and we need to wake them up because they have fallen asleep, some of them, not saying all, but more than the ones that are woke, mm -hmm. they are asleep. There's a lot of them that's just asleep, so they need to wake up. We need to get them moving, get them going, because mm -hmm. they got to do for the next generation. Amen. And we have to keep it going on and on and on. You know, we cannot stop. We free but we're not equal. So we got to get it together, young people. We got to come on and let's get it on. Amen. That's it. Just each generation. Because we I, we did our thing when we had to do what we had to mm -hmm. do in the 60s and the 70s. So now it's the 2000, the, what they calling y'all, millennials. Y'all got to <laughs> get it on. I just call you young black people because that millennial thing, it, it don't fall into it. It's a little trap because it says the way... It's telling you a way that you should be acting. Mm -hmm. So don't fall into it, you know. Anyway, welcome to Storrs Black History Corner. I am your host, Catherine Hunter Williams, along with my co-host, Miss Catherine Blake. Hello, everybody. <laughs> uh, that was just, I liked the way he ended that. That's all. And then, like I say, if y'all want to get this theme song, uh, theme song <clears throat> our theme song, I'll give you some information at the end of the program. Please help the young man. He's trying to be an entrepreneur. He's a, uh, what they call rappers. Mm -hmm. He's a rapper, and he made this theme song specifically for our program. That means he's a songwriter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, he's a songwriter. Mm -hmm. he, and it features Martin Luther King and, and uh, Malcolm X. And Amen. It's, it's, be proud to be black. I love it. But anyway, let's move on and go and get into the, to the program. Today we got some great stories to tell you. I'm going to tell you our story about a man you've seen on those Air Force commercials on Channel 4. I think it's Channel 4 and other channels. And you know, it's all of different channels around the country. Trying to recruit our young people to join the United States Air Force, Leland Melvin. What intrigued me about him is that he was one of our, one of our great astronauts that you didn't hear about. Mm. And Miss B is going to tell our story about Warren Wheeler, who was the first American black that owned his own airline. airline. All right. Can okay. You imagine that? No, I can't. And you know, <clears throat> is he still doing it now? No. So get into the story. Maybe we need to find out if it's some other blacks that own airlines because you don't hear about this. Mm -hmm. You don't hear that. And our youth need to know this that, so they can be uh, inspired mm -hmm. and aspire. Did I say it right? Yeah. Have the aspiration to maybe want to own your own uh, airline. Amen. Amen. So let's move forward, Miss B. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, at the last show, I uh, gave you some information about uh, Mrs. Jill Elaine Brown, who served as the first. African American woman to serve as a pilot for a major U.S. airline, the Texas International Airline, where we ran up on a black-owned airline, and I was really surprised. And was, I said, wait, "Was woman? Was she? Did she own her airline?" No, no, she was a pilot. Oh, she was the first pilot. She was a black woman, but and she was the first black woman pilot. pilot. Okay, so and we, she and she served as a pilot with the U.S. major airline, mm -hmm. the Texas International Airline. And she tried to go to the others, but they wouldn't have her. And you know why so. But anyway, but I was just surprised to find out that we had a black-owned airline because I'd never knew. heard of that. Mm -mm. Nope. So while African-American pilots continued to pound on the doors of commercial aviation, there were black entrepreneurs that started up and owned their own company providing air, air charter service, and flight schools. His name was, uh, it was called Wheeler 
Flying Service. And his name was Warren Wheeler, who opened a flying service in North Carolina's Raleigh Durham Airport in 1969. And at the time, a modest business, it's considered of one airline and one employee Wheeler. <laughs> but he has some. That's love. the way he started. Okay, because he did have some women pilots, and I liked him mm -hmm. for that. You know, from what I see. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in the mid-70s, the flying service had grown into a prosperous company with 11 aircraft, 31 employees, and a total sales approaching $1 million. And the airlines were the what, Cessna 402 and the Aero Stars. And, um, so, uh, wait a minute. Okay, a Cessna 402. Is that uh, like a like the little small? Pilot? Yeah, it's a small one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he didn't have something like United or American Airlines. Now he received his initial backing from the National Alliance of Federal and Postal Workers, a black union whose pensions fund uh, committed five hundred thousand dollars to start him off. Yeah, five hundred thousand. Well, you know, and that came later on. To invest in the capital. And after securing this funding, Hollis was also able to secure backing from the Equitable Life Assurance Society, which was $15 million. Ooh, okay. That's a lot and of money back a, in those a, a, days. A, but it's not that far back. From what I've seen, it was in the 80s. Um, no, 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 no. This airline only lasted three, three years. Okay, but was this was a, it started in sixty nine. In sixty nine, okay. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. And the Edna Life Insurance Company, they gave them seven point seven million dollars. And Air Atlanta had nearly ninety million in the startup funding by the time it took it to the skies in nineteen eighty four. So they it took time. Okay, I'm, that's where I'm seeing eighty four. That's why I say eighties. Mm -hmm. Okay. See, so it, it started in, in sixty nine with just one. He had to get funding. Yeah. To get it on, but to at buy, least he, yeah. he kept his. He kept. He was determined, and he did it. Mm hmm. Ooh. Okay. He established carriers like the Continental and the Braniff, uh, with fifty flight attendants. And many of them solicited as raw recruits. So you know what that means. They didn't know what they was doing. It was by, fly, by the seat of their pants. Mm -hmm. Doing the best they can with what they have. With mechanics and I'm not even, probably with some backyard mechanics too. Can you imagine that? Sometime, you know, when you go into business, mm -hmm. you, you don't gotta, necessarily know how to do this business but you learn yeah you go by the flying by the seat of your pants <laughs> yeah you do so at one point during the air atlanta which was a three-year existence it's non-union employee staff numbered 400 so he did get 400 people, people mm -hmm. to work for him how he, many planes did he have i'm coming to that oh, okay he purchased an initial aircraft fleet of five Boeing 727s. Oh, so he went bigger. Yeah. Oh. Uh, normally able to hold 100 passengers, the planes were outfitted with wider, roomier seats amounting to only 88 passengers. They had gourmet meals, were served on China. Ooh, I would have liked his plane mm -hmm. to fly on his flight. And had cloth napkins. Because what they doing to these people today is they don't get kind of nothing. Crazy. A bag of peanuts if you Hitting love them with baby strollers. <laughs> dragging them off the plane. I mean, this thing got a little crazy. Airlines are not what they used to be today. Right. But with Air Atlanta, they flew some 3 million passengers during their service lifetime and most of which were business travelers. And in the routes that included were New York, Memphis, My and Miami. Uh, the internal problems, which was a corn petition and lack of consistent cash flow, helped bring the early demise of the major, the first major commercial airline owned by an African-American. But that's kind of what happens 
mm-hmm. with a lot of us that go into business, mm-hmm. cash flow. Cash flow. If that flow of money don't keep coming in, mm-hmm. you go out of business. I know because uh, it's a certain business that I had and it was a non-profit organization. Mm-hmm. That money wasn't, it was coming, it was flowing for a minute and then... It stopped, and once it stopped, yeah, and I had to close the museum. I mean, that's just the way it goes. It's about money. Well, kudos to uh, Mr. William Wheeler. He was born in Durham, North Carolina, October the first, in nineteen forty-three. What did you say his name was? Harvey. I mean, William Hervey. I thought his name Wheeler. was Warren Wheeler. Yeah, he changed his name. He did? Yeah. <laughs> Why he do that? I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay. So also known as who? Yeah, as William, William Hervey. Hervey. That's his real name. Okay, so did he Warren ch- Wheeler is what he went under the airline. Under the airline. Okay, pseudo name. Yeah. So he attended American Flyer School in Ardmore, Oklahoma, where he earned his commercial license, pilot's license, at, at the age of 19. And uh, he opened his own flying school at Horace Williams Airport that same year in 1962. And he founded that airline, as I said before, in 1969. Mm. So um, uh, in the 1980s, the airline did grow. He did manage to successfully uh, fly 40,000 passengers before they ceased operations in 1991. Oh, so that wasn't that long ago. No, it wasn't. Okay. Mm, I wonder if, if if there are any other blacks that own airlines because sometimes... That's, that's a good thing to look up uh, to. Yeah, blacks have uh, different businesses that we don't know about. Mm-hmm. You know, they behind them or they, they backing this or they doing this or buying this. and We don't know about it. So that was some great information right there. Well, uh, one, another piece too. Uh, his father, uh, John H. Wheeler, headed the family business, uh, the Mechanics and Farmers Bank, which was the fourth largest African-American bank in the country at that time. Mm-hmm. And that that's something else we that's can That's something also, too. Mm-hmm. Yep. Blacks that own banks. Bl- mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And they, it's still some blacks that own banks today. You just right. Don't, I don't think it's any up here in Michigan, but they are around the country. Well, I, I that'll be something to speak on. Something to look up. On, yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So that's our story about uh, our black-owned airline, which you didn't know we had. Owned by Warren Wheeler and also known as Warren. Uh, he uh, known as William Hervey Wheeler. All right. That was so he changed. Born. He had it. That's his born. Yeah, his born his, name is God given name. And it's Hervey, H E R V E Y, not Harvey. Hervey. Okay. Well, that was an awesome story. Mm-hmm. Somebody buzzing. That's my phone. Okay. All right, let's move forward. Let me talk to you about this. He was a child genius. And there was, as a child, there was a battle of brightness for him going on in his school. But I'll get to that a little later. Leland Devon Melvin was born February 15th, 1964. In Lynchburg, Virginia. Mm, He is an American black engineer and a former NASA NASA astronaut. Really? And that's that's what got me because I didn't know that he was an astronaut. Never had heard of him. Mm. You know, they have some that's out there, but who would have known that there was some that's still going on? Well, he's not an astronaut today, but it's not that long ago that he retired, you know? Mm-hmm. So, anyway, um, he served on board the space shuttle Atlantis. As a mission specialist on STS-122 and as a mission specialist one on STS-129, Melvin was named the NASA Associate Administrator for Education in October 2010. Melvin attended Heritage High School and then went on to the University of Richmond, 
on a football scholarship. That's how a lot of our youth get to go to school, especially sports. our boys. It's through sports. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if they get into entertainment, it's like they don't ever go back to school. It's like they, you know, but Shaq, Shaq is the only one that uh, I really know that went back to school and he got a master's degree or a doctorate in uh, education. Oh. So maybe one day we talk about old big tall Shaq. <laughs> I like him. He seems to have a sweet spirit. Amen. Yeah. Okay, where he received a bachelor's degree in chemistry. In 1991, he received a master's of science degree in material science engineering from the University of Virginia. His parents, Deems and Grace Melvin, resided in Lynchburg, Virginia. His recreational interests included photography, piano, reading, music, cycling, tennis, and snowboarding. Melvin appeared as a elimination challenge guest judge in the 12th episode of Top Chef. Oh, really? Yeah, so he's a, also a chef, huh? Wow. Season 7. With his dogs, he loved his dogs. In the seventh season of the dog, he was on that also, like that guy that do the whispers, mm -hmm. dog whispers. Yeah, the dog whisper, and it was and was the host of Child Genius season one and two. Oh, he is the president of the Spaceship Earth Grant, a public benefit corporation where mission whose mission is to make space more accessible through human flight space flight and parabolic flight award to individual applicants. Melvin was a receiver. This is a, talking about his football career. He was a wide receiver on the University of Richmond football team from eight, 1982 to 1985. Melvin is the first on the University of Richmond's career list with 198 receptions for 2,669 yards <clears throat> and fourth on Richmond's career touchdown receptionist list with 16. Now, I don't know a whole lot about sports, but since they put that in here, I felt it was well worth mentioning. Amen. He was an AP Honorable Mention All-American Selection in 1984 and 1985 and second team Apple Academic All-America in 1985. A team captain during the senior season, Melvin had his best year in 1985 with 65 catches for 956 yards and 8 touchdowns. His top game was in 1984 against James Madison University. So these are all college games, university mm -hmm. games, when he had 10 catches for 208 yards and one touchdown. Melvin caught at least one pass in every game he played as a Richmond Spider. Mm. He was in the University of Richmond's Athletic Hall of Fame. And he was a genius, inducted, too. Inducted class of 1996 through 1997 and selected for the All UR Stadium team in 2009 which commemorates the great spiders to have played at the Stoke Stadium, get my words right, in his 81-year history. Melvin was chosen by the Detroit Lions. See, this is why I thought what? he was from Flint. Yeah, not Flint, but I thought he was from Michigan, mm -hmm. down in Detroit. That's why I said, let me do a story on him. Because you see him, like I said, on the uh, um, United States Air Force. He's a recruiter mm -hmm. for that. But I didn't know he was an astronaut till I really mm -hmm. looked him up. And a genius <clears throat> on top of that. Because mm -hmm. most of them are nerds and they don't do much sports. or. But that's that's quite an accomplishment. He was a child genius. Yeah. Yep. During training camp, he pulled a hamstring and was released from the team. That's from the Detroit Lions. He reported to the Dallas Cowboy. Oh, I love the Cowboys. The following spring, but pulled a hamstring a oh. second time, officially ending his professional football career. He also participated in the Toronto Agronauts football training camp. Now, let's talk about his career at NASA. NASA. Melvin began working in a non-destructive evaluation science branch at NASA. Langley Research Center in 1989. 
His responsibilities included using optical fiber sensors to measure strain, temperature, and chemical damage in both composite and metallic structures. Wow. <laughs> ah, Lord have mercy. Like, I, I don't know mostly what any of this is about. Well, some of it. You could just know what the words is, like temperature mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and chemical damage. Uh, in 1994, he was selected to lead the vehicle health monitoring team for the cooperative NASA Lockheed Martin X-33 reusable launch vehicle program. In 1996, he co-designed and monitored construction of an optical non-destructive evaluation facility capable of pro producing in line fiber optic sensors. Hmm. Okay. See, like when we do be talking about these astronauts and everything, they always be dealing with fiber optic sensors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. John, do you know what fiber optic sensors are? Those little I know bodies. what fiber optics are, but I don't know what sensors, no. Huh? I know what fiber optics are, mm -hmm. yeah. It's like using like like glass like fiber to actually transmit instead like of metal metallic, mm -hmm. you know, metallic wire. Lines like Catherine was talking about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, selected as an astronaut in June 1998, Melvin reported for training in August 1998. He has since been assigned to the Astronaut Office Space Station Operations Branch and the Education Department of NASA Headquarters in Washington, D.C. As co-manager of NASA's Educator Astronaut Program, Melvin has traveled across the country discussing space ex exploration with teachers and students and promoting science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Mm. He needs to come to Flint. Amen. We do have a wonderful place here. Uh, what is it called? Kettering mm -hmm. University, which is for engineers. And we need somebody to come and let our children see an actual person. Absolutely. Actual person. You know, not just see him on television with his... Uh, mm -hmm. a suit on and all that or pictures of him on the internet an actual person telling them that they can do this absolutely because I, I don't think a lot of our children know what they can do that's within them you know they just if, if you don't have parents to push you or mm -hmm. give you expose you to different things it's not going to happen well you know uh, uh, Miss Ella Green Moten is involved in that science project uh, with uh, high school students mm -hmm. and I think they're having uh, uh, some type of introduction coming up pretty soon um, with uh, they haven't chosen the school yet but for the last I'd say three years that I've known about that she's been introducing uh, this, this uh, introduction to science math and engineering I know she uh, had a program over at the uh, Sloan Museum, and it was about uh, uh, health, mm. and she had the students do all oh, the blood spots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. on diabetes. Mm -hmm. Very interesting because see, I'm diabetic. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm gonna say they say I am. <laughs> I'm not trying to claim it. You know how they say, don't claim it. But you know, your body lets you know that certain things is going on with mm -hmm. you, so you need to deal with it. You know. But Christian, don't claim that here, yeah, right? Amen. <laughs> Body will say, okay, you finna fall, girl. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but it was some things that I didn't even know about diabetics that mm -hmm. I learned from them youth over there. So that was a very interesting program. And if she's doing something with engineering and mm -hmm. science, yes, she is, yes. that's good to get them out there, promote them, and let our youth know that they can do this. Absolutely. It's so much, it's a broad spectrum mm -hmm. of engineering, mm -hmm. just like this. He's an astronaut. You know, so it's a, it's a lot that, that, that you could do in mm -hmm. science. I'm introducing a little science projects to my great grandson. Mm -hmm. uh, baking soda and, and vinegar and making the volcano. Yeah. You know, it, it's little little things like that you got in your home that makes them as excited. And you can see it in their eyes. Yeah. He, he his eyes got so big. He's like, do it again. Yeah. <laughs> and they will say that in a minute. Yeah. Let's do it again. <laughs> God. It's, 
interesting. Over, I work over at Sloan Museum, and we have what they it's this exhibit called the Titanic at this point. Mm -hmm. And when no, some of those children, because they be experts, mm -hmm. they have watched, but they watched the one that was done in 1997. With uh, Leonardo uh, DiCaprio. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I think Kate Blanchard. I think that's her name. Anyway, they was the two lovers. Actually, that's not real. But see, in our exhibit, they have um, uh, the iceberg, a simulation of an iceberg. Oh, really? Really. And they be, when they come in and I, you know, they tell me, they tell me, I, I know about that. I know the Titanic. I know the Titanic. So I <laughs> ask them a question like, well, have you have you seen the movie called A Night to Remember? <laughs> <laughs> that was about the Titanic too, and it's also a little um, more accurate than with this one here with Leonardo. They just romanticized that one, mm -hmm. and they, that diamond, the big diamond that you seen her throw away at the end. No, that didn't happen. <laughs> that didn't happen. But anyway, that's the, I. I loved when I had the museum, and I used to see. Uh, I had uh, an exhibit with inventions, and when they would see the mic, just say for instance, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that blacks invented the mic, but they would see that, and they it's a look that get, they get in their eyes that says, mm -hmm. "Wow, we did that." Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. and you see the light come on in their eyes. You know, it's like it, it's, it's 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 so awesome mm -hmm. to see that. Or just to see them be excited about learning something mm -hmm, new. Mm -hmm. Like that Titanic. When they go over there, they get the truth. Because it mm -hmm. is an exhibit. And it tells them the truth. <laughs> it tells them the truth about it. But I like to mess with them. Like, when did the uh, boat sink? When did the Titanic sink? And they always say April 14th. Yeah, well, that's when the iceberg hit it. But it didn't sink until the 15th. I love messing with them because you just think, yes, I know, I know all about it, you know, and they just, they, it's all in their eyes and then, then I'll pop a question to them, mess them up. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so good to see this bulb on in their eye, this light mm -hmm. that's in there, that they done learn something. All right, let's, let's get off of that. Let's move on. And they follow that Titanic. People go all over the country following that exhibit. Really? I, I'm amazed at it because I'm saying the boat y'all be buying, they are coffins. People died in there. You know? <laughs> the boat sank. You're not finna go on a ride. And they actually be thinking they finna get on the ride, but they're not. Oh. It's a sunken boat, an exhibit that they had them pulled up out of the ocean and they have things on display. Mm hmm. It's not a ride. Okay. <laughs> think, I'm telling you, we going for the ride. Oh, no, you're not. The ship is a sucker. You suck, you know. Anyway, I have some fun over there. And it, I, I just gave them some advertisement, didn't I? <laughs> I did. Let's get back to Leland. Uh, he next served in the robotics branch, which you kind of talking about. Mm. Well, well, no, you was talking about uh, Volcano. Mm-hmm. But that's a part of engineering of the of the astronaut office. In October 2010, Melvin was named as associate administrator for the Office of Education. As associate administrator, Melvin was responsible for the development and implementation of NASA's education program that inspired interest in science and technology and raised public awareness. This is why he's doing those commercials, but it's more so for the Air Force. Mm -hmm. But he also said that you could do these other things that you could, once you get into the Air Force, you could be an astronaut and raise public awareness about NASA's goals and missions. He retired from NASA in, in February 2014. Oh, he just retired. Yep. He, uh, Melvin flew two missions, so he done been out there actually okay. in space. Uh, on the Space Shuttle Atlantis as a mission specialist, which I've already told you, uh, talked about earlier, on the on STS-122 and as a mission specialist, one on STS-129. STS-122, February 7 to February 20, he was out there a wow. while, in 2008, that wasn't that long ago, mm -hmm. was the 24th shuttle 
mission to visit the International Space Station. Mission highlight was the mission's highlight was the delivery and installation of the European Space Agency Columbus Laboratory. It took three spacewalks by crew members to prepare the Columbus Laboratory for its scientific work and to replace in three to replace and expanded nitrogen tank on the S on the station P1 truss. That's T U R S S. ST1-122 was also a crew replacement mission delivering expedition 16 flight engineer EA ESA astronaut Leopold Iharts and returning home with expedition 16 flight engineer so they went up there to get somebody and bring them back mm -hmm. and to work on this um, station out there mm -hmm. yeah uh, returning home with expedition, expedition 16 flight engineer NASA astronaut Daniel Tanney. The STS-122 mission was accomplished in 12 days, 18 hours, 21 minutes and 40 seconds and traveled 5,296,832 wow. statute miles in two Hundred and three Earth orbits. Wow. Yeah, right. I know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely know what that is. STS-129, November 16th to November 29th, was the 31st shuttle flight to the International Space Station. During the mission, the crew delivered two express logistic carriers to the International Space Station, about 30,000 pounds of replacement parts, for systems that provide power to the station and keep it from overheating and maintain proper orientation in space. The mission also featured three spacewalks. I bet you that's something to be out in space walking. I'd be scared to death. I would too. In fact, I'd be scared to death to be up there. <laughs> uh, yeah. Looking down at that's the earth. That's too high for me. It's too high. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> the STS-129 mission was completed in 10 days, 19 hours, 16 minutes. They are really detailed at 13 seconds. Traveling 4.5 million miles in 171 orbits. And returned to Earth bringing back with them NASA astronaut Nicole. That's a woman. Mm. They got a woman just stopped. Just came back and she uh, has the most days recorded up in space. Mm. Yeah, she was in the news the other day. Is, isn't Nicole Stott? Or I can't woman? remember her name. Okay. Following her tour of duty aboard the space station, Melvin has logged, logged over 565 hours in space. Wow. That is our story. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, as I had said earlier, you, you if you you can catch him on commercials because he is the one who is promoting or recruiting young men and women to be uh, in the Air Force to become members of the Air Force. Wow. He's still walking around. He's still alive. So I can't say that uh, he has joined his ancestors because mm -hmm. he's still around. But he, his time and space is 23D13H28M. Not sure what that means. Uh, selection 1998 NASA Group. His mission STS-122, STS-129. STS uh, that's Leland D. Or Devon Melvin. Hey Amen. That's our story about him. That's wonderful. Yeah. It is because you know, he, I've been watching him on commercials mm -hmm. and I'm saying, wow, you know, I wouldn't mind being a pilot to fly planes, but then that would be too high for me too. But I think it's a thing that you get used to. Mm -hmm. If you get into it, you get the training for it and, and different things. But I don't think I would be a person or candidate to go into mm. space. Well, that's quite a transition from football, sports, to uh, NASA. To NASA. Yeah. yeah. To an engineer. 
and going into space Amen. on two missions, not one, <laughs> two. Uh, now, on Warren Wheeler that, that Catherine was talking about, you know, he was he was speaking about we need to bridge disparities of aviation and aerospace employment. Uh, which is a door, is a door that the door is opening wider every day for students to chart a new course to aviation's career. We need to do this. Mm -hmm. We was talking about that earlier. We need to have somebody out there. But what I would like if they would bring people here, like I had said, mm -hmm. that the children and the youth can see somebody actually alive doing this. Absolutely. You know, like him coming here, uh, Leland coming here and you know, talking about bringing it, he could, you know, come in with his suit on, his astronaut suit mm -hmm. on. Ooh, that would really. Yeah, excite yeah. them. Give them something to be excited about because our children need it, you Not know. Not something you just see on TV, but in person. In person. Face to face. Yep. And, you know, they uh, like to encourage more students to explore this wonderful prof profession. Which is both of them is the airline mm -hmm. owning one owning an airline. You know, you never know, young people, when you grow up, what you might be mm -hmm. and how much money you might have. You never know, but you must be aspired, mm -hmm. aspire for that. Because if it's not there, you got to have the mm -hmm. thought first. If the thought is not in your mind, it's not gonna happen. And he did it. He did it. He did it. Yep. And did it with class. It might not about, might not have been as long as he ever mm -hmm. would have liked to. But he, but did, he it. did it. Mm -hmm. So you know, and that's that's what I said about the museum. I mm -hmm. did it. Amen. For real. <laughs> but I did it. All right. That's our story about astronaut Leland Melvin and the first American the first American black to own his own airline. Yes. Warren Wheeler. Also known well, as, as William Hervey Wheeler. Wheeler. All right. Be sure to watch Political Pundit Dr. George Moss every Monday at 2 p.m. on allpointtv.com and YouTube. Also, some of allpointstv.com programs come on Comcast Channel 17 every Tuesday evening from 8.30 to 9.30. I did catch George, John, on this past one. Well, and what tickles me is he be tickling himself. He be in there just laughing <laughs> about what he finna speak about or about people. And it just tickles him. And, he, you know, he got this kind of laugh. You heard him laugh, John? Yeah. <laughs> he, he got one of these kind of laughs. But he just, just tickled me. But I did catch him. Uh, as always, Catherine and I would like to say Asante, which means thanks. To all of you who have watched our program today, and we hope and pray that you have learned some great information about our story, and we'll pass it on to your children, and pass they pass it on, Amen. and keep it going. We must keep our stories alive. Amen. <clears throat> As always, we encourage you to learn more about our story and to keep it alive in the hearts and minds of our children. Which would, you know, it gives them self worth, it gives them higher self esteem, mm -hmm. a whole lot of things that it gives them if they know who they are, where they came from, right. know who God is, moves them up, you know. Now I want to leave you with this. This is a quote from activist Stokely Carmichael, mm -hmm. and only some I call them OGs. Uh, you know what OG is? Yeah. Because we OGs. <laughs> <laughs> we are. Okay. Also known as Kwame Ture. Our lips are big. Our noses are broad. Our hair is nappy. Mm. We are black. Amen. And we are beautiful. Amen. Hey. Until next time, we want you to know and always remember that American blacks are a spiritually strong and resilient people and that with God on our side, no one can keep us down. Love yourself. Always be proud to be black and always keep on keeping on with us. Hotel, which means peace. peace.